tried to make it work, but um, didn't really believe in all the characters, and so that can't be hidden from people who love Spider-Man. If the director doesn't love something, it's wrong of them to make it. With much beloved characters that Stan Lee created, and people really hold them so dear to them that you don't want to mess up, and I messed up plenty with the third Spider-Man. So people, you know, hated me for for years. They still hate me. They give you, they give you shit for that all the time. Yeah. Why? What do they say? Um, we hate you. Parker, what's happened to you? I don't know. That was the teaser for Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3 feels like three different movies mashed together. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3 is messy. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3 is no Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. But you know what? Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3 is not a bad film, not even close. I would go as far to say that Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3 is in fact a good film. Hell, it's even a great film and it's an almost perfect finale to his beloved take on our favorite wall crawler. Here's why. The symbiote is the ultimate story in the comics and that's Eddie Brock who becomes Venom. The pressure and producers. Okay. So imagine making Spider-Man 1, the first ever big screen adaptation of one of your favorite characters, all right? Imagine feeling the immense pressure that comes with adapting something you love. Imagine having to invent the film look, feel, and tone of that beloved character. Imagine having to do that and having no idea if it would work. Hell, it shouldn't have worked. There's no reason Spider-Man should work as well as it does, but it did. Oh boy, yeah, it did. You made the studio a lot of money, but that didn't matter to you. What mattered was how the audience responded to your movie, your take on this character that had meant the world to you growing up. And they loved it. They adored it. You did it, champ. Good fucking job. Okay, now imagine you have to do it again. But this time, you have to top yourself, top everything you invented and crafted in that first movie. This time, you get more personal. You tell a story about learning to be better while trying to make something that is better. You put your heart out there for everyone to see, everyone to feel. You are risking it all. Nobody has really made a superhero film that's this personal, this empathetic, this human. If you fuck this up, the entire world will hate you. After all, they loved your first movie, but you don't fuck it up. You don't even come close to fucking it up. In fact, you make the best damn superhero movie ever made. Critics who didn't love your first movie now love your second movie. Audiences who liked your first movie are swooning over this one. They adore it. They realize how human it is, how personal it was to you, and they love you for it. You are unbeatable. But wait, now you're expected to do a third movie and you have to do it in the next three years. How could you possibly top the movie you just made? You laid your heart out there on a platter for the audience to gobble down with their overpriced popcorn into their oversized stomachs, and they did. You can't possibly do more than that, can you? Okay, well you have to try. You have to fucking try because it's what the studio wants, it's what the audience wants, and it's what you want. You know you can make the perfect third movie, you know how to make the perfect third movie. You just need to stick with Peter, Mary Jane, Harry. That's what the franchise has always been about. That's where your interests lie. And now come to think of it, you love the look and cinematic potential of this character Sandman. Okay, progress the story of the main trio and have the Sandman be the new big bad. The audience will love that. But wait, now your producer wants to have a meeting with you. He wants to tell you that you're being selfish. How could you be selfish? You poured your entire soul into these two movies. Apparently you're selfish because you haven't been thinking about the fans? How could you not think about the fans? You are making these movies for the fans. You're not thinking about the fans because you aren't doing the villain that they want to see. Well, who do they want to see? You ask yourself. And your producer tells you they want to see a villain that you have absolutely no interest in doing. You tell them that you don't know much about this villain. You stopped religiously reading Spider-Man comics a long time ago. You've been too busy making Spider-Man movies. And your producer responds by showing you fan mail, drawings, emails, all demanding that you do this villain. You realize that you aren't getting guilt tripped into doing this villain. You realize that you are not being asked to do this villain but rather told. 
Well, shit. I have to imagine that's what went through Sam Raimi's head. You've heard the stories. I've told you the stories before. To fully appreciate Spider-Man 3, you can't hold it to the incredibly high standards set by the first two films. Those were Sam Raimi films. Every frame, every choice, everything was so Sam Raimi. And the sad reality is that Spider-Man 3 was never going to be 100% Sam Raimi. The blueprint, the script, the ideas from the execs guaranteed that this wouldn't be the natural progression of the story told in 1 and 2. There was a mandate that we put in, you know, a desire to put in Venom. And once Venom comes into something, it demands so many changes because you, then you're telling the story of Eddie Brock. It has so much story material with it that it just put the whole screenplay into, a, I think, an upheaval for the longest time. Given all that information, given the fact that Raimi was still writing pages of the script and figuring out what the movie was while they were shooting the damn thing, where do we start? No, seriously, I don't know what to talk about first. I have pages and pages of notes, but they are a hot mess of radical rampant Raimi ramblings. Fuck. Let's switch things up and start here. Yeah. Oh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> the filmmaking. There is no denying that Raimi, cinematographer Bill Pope, and the entire crew were at the top of their creative game. Creativity oozes from every scene, every camera move, every storytelling choice, and every single one of these ridiculously insane and innovative action sequences. The scale of this movie is unbelievable. Analysts and reporters at the time theorized that the movie went far over its already absurd initial budget of $250 million. As production dragged on into late summer, it had been scheduled to conclude in June. Stories about the project's ballooning budget started popping up all over town, but in the end, even the most hyperbolic of observers may have underestimated the final tab. Industry insiders claim that Sony spent $350 million or more on production alone. With marketing and promotion factored in, the total price tag will approach half a billion dollars, positioning Spider-Man 3 as the most expensive movie of all time. Did you know that the team tried out various types of sand to find the perfect look for the Sandman? I didn't. Did you know that's a real camera crashing through these real cars? I didn't. Did you know that this entire construction site is a giant controllable set built in a studio? I didn't. It's clear from watching the behind the scenes that everyone involved in the production wanted to top the extraordinary bar set by Spider-Man 2. They wanted to make it more grand, more intense. They wanted to make Spider-Man 3 the biggest Spider-Man film ever. But as we all know, bigger does not always mean better. This film was being written so in so many versions, so many different ways. We had to all start working on it before it was ready. 10 minutes into Spider-Man 3 and there's already a lot to unpack. I mentioned this in part two, but I can't stress enough how much I adore these opening credits. Raimi really knows how to make these movies feel like events and not episodes or installments in a franchise. He gives the audience a stylish and operatic refresher on what happened in 1 and 2 while building up hype for the adventure you are about to go on, while also giving me freaking goosebumps while somehow making them tell a story. I mean, we get to see Peter's entire story so far. We get to experience the emotions he felt through the music. Christopher Young's Venom theme, along with the actual Venom symbiote, comes smashing in as soon as Peter experiences the tragedies that that define him. And as that Venom theme, and as the goo takes over our eyes and ears, 
Elfman's Spider-Man theme comes swinging back in. It's almost like the music and visuals in the credits are telling the story of light versus dark, positivity and negativity, tragedy and responsibility. It's ridiculously well done and just wild. Anyways, I love how we open the movie on a Peter Parker filled with pride and joy watching himself on a larger than life screen. What a wonderful way of visually setting up Peter's ego and vanity. Hey, stick around. It's going to start again in a couple minutes. Yeah, that's okay. Peter goes on to talk about all his accomplishments and just how happy he is. It's such a drastic, almost shocking difference to the openings of one and two. It's nice to see Peter finally be happy, to make it to class, to not be completely broke, to be loved as Spider-Man and as Peter. It's nice to see MJ singing on Broadway and Peter finally being there to see it and support it. Also, this little moment is my favorite Harry moment in the series. Franco kills it right here, that look of anger and resentment, but underneath that there's this bit of nostalgia, nostalgia for his old friend. It humanizes Harry a little before he becomes the goblin. I'm sorry, the new goblin. Take on the mysterious new goblin. I think a lot of my issues with Spider-Man 3 begin here. As soon as Harry takes his father's formula eight minutes into the movie, five if we aren't counting the opening credits, you can already tell that there are way too many cooks in the creative kitchen and Raimi is struggling to balance all the plates trying to establish all three of the main plots and villains. Compare that to Spider-Man 2 where Doc Ock isn't introduced until the 19 minute mark. 20 minutes into Spider-Man 3 and we have been introduced to Peter's Ego, the Symbiote, the Sandman, and Little Goblin Jr. In fact, Peter is already having his first fight with Harry 20 minutes in. That's a lot to take in in 20 minutes, and my biggest problem is that there is no natural sense of flow. I talked about how perfect Raimi's pacing was in the first two films, and going into this one, it's very jarring to see the film cut from this to this, back to this, which leads to this, and then to this, in all under 10 minutes. And don't get me wrong, none of these scenes are bad. I actually love all of them individually. I really do. I mean, come on, how could you not love this? You know what? I'd like to sing on stage for the rest of my life with you in the first row. I'll be there. Or this tearjerker. And he was holding this ring, dazzling in front of me. I thought it was the sun. But I would be lying if I said I didn't miss the slower paced intimacy of Spider-Man 2. That intimacy is what allowed us to have such empathy for Peter and feel the longing he felt for Mary Jane, but now that Peter is losing that empathy and is finally together with Mary Jane, we need to spend more time with these characters than ever. I wish I could see them happy and successful together for more than a few brief scenes before Mary Jane's career and life pulls a Parker and goes to shit. I wish I could see that fully developed hero and grown man from the end of Spider-Man 2 before he becomes engulfed by his own vanity. Let's talk about that. Who is it that breaks your fall, puts out the flames, and saves your children? Spider-Man! They love me. The real villain of Spider-Man 3. Can we talk about the balls on this movie? This is balls on a filmmaker. Raimi takes our lovable protagonist from the first two films, the empathetic, sensitive, and lovable Peter Parker, and he pumps him full of ego and pride. And you know what that ego and pride do? They take away that sensitivity, that understanding, and that empathy for others that define Peter's heroism thus far. Peter's too caught up in his own shit and success to really be there for MJ, to talk to her about how she is feeling. He can only throw empty platitudes her way. You just gotta believe in yourself and you pull yourself together you get right back on the horse. And... Don't give me the horse thing. Try and understand how I feel. He's not trying to be isolating, but it's clear he would much rather focus on the gratification he now gets from being Spider-Man. Another wonderful contrast to Spider-Man 2. No more. They love me. He would rather focus on that than focus on the real everyday hardships that come with relationships. I look at these words. It's like my father wrote them. You're trash! You're always gonna be trash, just like her! I have to go to school! Ah, who's stuck? All cars, all cars in the vicinity of 54th and 6th Avenue, please report. Crane out of control. Approach with caution. Go get him, Tiger. 
It's sad. He longed for Mary Jane for two movies and now they are finally together and she doesn't feel comfortable enough with him to tell him about getting fired from the show. And Pete feels so secure in himself that he doesn't see the problem with doing this to Mary Jane. You would think that Peter would understand exactly what MJ is going through. He went through it one movie ago. But the truth is, he doesn't really care to understand. Peter's too caught up in his pride to be honest with Harry when Harry gets amnesia. For fuck's sake, he even tries to stop him from remembering they're complicated. No! History, because that would make things even harder for him. This pride, this ego, it takes away the emotional honesty, the empathy that makes Peter Spider-Man. Well, in a separate story than the black suit, yeah. Ivan and I had him falling to the sin of pride. It was all about how pride won't allow him to be wrong and how it makes him look at Flint Marco as a villain and himself as a hero and how he's going to take on a grander sense of right and wrong and the grays of this world of morality by the end of the piece. The dinner scene is a perfect example of how far Peter has fallen while Spider-Man has risen. Peter plans to propose to MJ right after doing the kiss with Gwen, and we get this hilariously uncomfortable scene where he is so out of touch with MJ, with himself, and with their relationship that he is 100% certain that she will love and accept his romantic proposal. How'd that get in there? <laughs> oh, don't cry. He believes that everything must be wonderful for her because everything's going great for him. He barely lets her get a word in and lacks any sense of self-awareness. see Spider-Man posters in the window, the kids running around with me on their sweaters. It's a big Halloween item. I don't know, I guess I've become something of an icon. And then to make matters absurdly bad, in typical Raimi fashion, Gwen shows up. After all, who gets kissed by Spider-Man, right? <laughs> I can't imagine. And then when MJ asks completely understandable questions about Gwen and about that kiss. When you kissed her, who was kissing her? Spider-Man or Peter? What do you mean? Peter responds by being fucking clueless and not understanding why MJ is upset in the first place. Come on, I wouldn't have even shown up to that dinner. I gotta give MJ a ton of credit for putting up with this dork's new narcissistic ass. But what I think really makes this scene hit home is the phone call that takes place right after where Peter can't even apologize for anything that occurred that night or admit that he did anything wrong. I wish you'd pick up the phone. I don't know what's going on or... Uh if you got the messages or what but uh just want to talk to you the parade the dinner and this phone call serve as the beginning of peter's downward spiral his descent into ego and grandiosity an hour into the movie raimi has laid the groundwork given us plenty of great scenes established all his new characters and further developed the trio the trilogy has been following but this is where peter's arc really begins why, why weren't we told about this? Settle down, son. No, I have no intention of settling down. This man killed my uncle, and he's still out there. Sandman. The villains in this trilogy have always been used to tell the audience about Peter. They are always intrinsically tied to Peter Parker, whether it's his best friend's dad or one of Peter's idols. Raimi had the challenge of not only making Sandman a sympathetic villain, but also connecting Flint Marco to Peter Parker, a character Peter has never had any real personal connection to outside of being a crook that Spider-Man must stop. He needed Sandman to tie into the idea of ego, as well as lead Peter to the path of forgiveness and understanding. Sandman feels the most like a classic Raimi Spider-Man villain likable, visually so much fun, and entirely sympathetic. His goals are misguided, but they are also noble. He wants to get money to try and save his dying daughter, but the way he goes about it makes him a criminal in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of his wife. You are an escaped convict. The cops are looking for you. You're not getting near her. You're nothing but a common thief. Flint Marco's entire character in Spider-Man 3 can be summed up with this one brilliant line. Not a bad person. I just had bad luck. And boy, does he have some shitty luck. That's probably a bird. It'll fly away when we fire it up. Everything I could possibly say about this scene right here has been said. It's magnificent, and to this day, I still can't figure out exactly where the image switches from an entirely CG shot to Thomas Hayden Church walking out of the sand. 
A lot of people don't like the idea that Raimi retconned the death of Uncle Ben in order to achieve that personal connection, but I do. I really do. It doesn't fundamentally change the origin of Spider-Man. His uncle was still killed that night for being the only one who did the right thing. That hasn't changed. The only difference now is who pulled the trigger and how that revelation affects Peter. So how does that revelation affect Peter? Imagine if you thought you got the guy who killed your dad. You thought he was dead and gone. You're finally happy with yourself, maybe too happy, but you still think about your father every day. And then years later, you find out that he wasn't killed by the guy you stopped. He wasn't killed by the man you indirectly caused the death of. He was killed by someone entirely different. Someone that you just fought that day, but let get away. And that someone is also made out of sand. Of course you, or any human being, would be mad and obsess over getting the son of a bitch who killed the man who raised you. And that's exactly what Peter does. And that's where... <gasps> the black suit comes into play. I'm going to hit you with a series of hot takes about the infamous black suit. The symbiote. The... <laughs> The black suit is great, even though Raimi didn't want to do it. The symbiote doesn't take away from any of the themes or ideas Raimi is laying out, but adds to them. It helps showcase and serve as a literal representation of Peter's ego or his dark side. It can be viewed as a metaphor for drug addiction or alcoholism, especially in the editor's cut of the film. This black substance is really a metaphor for the darkness that comes over Peter's heart. It latches on to Peter at his lowest, most angry point, right after he pushes Mary Jane away. I want to be here for you. Okay. I get it. Thank you. But um, I'm fine. I, I don't need your help. Right when Peter needs the people around him to humanize him and be there for him, he pushes them away. The symbiote becomes his crutch, and he continues to abuse it throughout the rest of the film. When he needs to hunt down the Sandman who killed his uncle, what does he turn to? The black suit. After MJ is forced to leave him, what does he turn to? The black suit. After he figures out that Harry is... I'm the other guy. What does he turn to? The black suit. Peter, like most addicts, doesn't care who he hurts while he's wearing it. He only cares about the fact that it makes him feel... This feels good. It makes him feel powerful even more powerful than he already is. It comes at the perfect time in his life where he is forgetting the responsibility element of that great power. The black suit is ballsy. Sure, wearing it somehow makes hair gel and eyeliner magically appear on Peter, and let me just say, I'm all for the Raimi camp, but that's just silly. Sure, it makes Peter dance like a dork, but that is 100% what this character would do to try and be cool. Because guess what, kids? Peter Parker ain't cool. That dance montage is an impeccable juxtaposition to the raindrops keep falling on my head scene from Spider-Man 2. In fact, in the editor's cut that I just mentioned, the James Brown montage takes place right after this happens. That's so twisted. Black Suit Peter is celebrating blowing off half of his best friend's face. In this version, it's much clearer that Raimi was going for his classic dark twisted humor. This scene was always supposed to be hilarious and make you cringe, but watching it placed where it was originally intended, you get a sense that you're supposed to feel bad for laughing. I guess a lot of people forget the moments where the symbiote makes Peter do some real horrendous shit. I see people talk about the cheese, about the dancing, about this. Now dig on this. But I never see people mention the evil it brings out of Peter. For God's sakes, he murders the Sandman after forcing his face into a train. Marco doesn't stay dead, he just turns to mud so we can focus on other characters, but you have to remember that Peter thinks he just straight up killed this guy, and what's scary is that he has no problem with it. Good riddance. Peter Parker, the guy who saved the day by empathizing with Otto Octavius in the last movie, now has no problem with killing a man. He's actually relieved that Flint is dead, and believes Aunt May should be relieved as well. Spider-Man killed him. Spider-Man? I don't understand. 
Spider-Man doesn't kill people. And that's not as bad as it gets, not even close. It's not getting Brock fired from the bugle. It's not almost killing his best friend either. The most dishonorable, heinous, and disgusting thing Peter does while under the influence of the alien goo is use Gwen Stacy, and I mean actually use her, to get back at Mary Jane. Peter shows up at MJ's new job, a job she's probably embarrassed of, with a girl he said meant nothing to him, and dances Gwen around like an object, showing her off, interrupting MJ's performance, embarrassing her, humiliating Gwen in the process, and then... <laughs> No music, no insane camera move, just the raw impact of what just happened. He hit her. When I saw this as a kid, I was shocked and it's still insanely shocking now. How could Peter Parker, how could Spider-Man hit Mary Jane? This isn't Spider-Man, this isn't Peter. Peter would never. Who are you? I don't know. That's why he takes the suit off. He has lost every part of himself and now he has hurt the woman whom he always swore to protect. And I think Peter realizes that it's not the suit's fault. It's not Sandman's fault. It's not Harry's. It's his own fault. If he wasn't so filled with pride, if he was there for Mary Jane, if he was there for Harry, if he wasn't so self-involved, if he wasn't so focused on his own emotions, then none of this would have happened. Peter had that happy life that he always dreamt of having with Mary Jane, and he threw it all away. That is so adult, so real, and so human. If you've learned anything over the course of this three-part series, hopefully it's just how human these films are. I doubt we will ever get another Spider-Man movie that takes this big a risk with the character of Peter Parker. Peter goes to the bell tower and rips off the suit, rips off this alien symbiote that has bonded and absorbed all of Peter's pride, his vanity, and his anger. And as he is ripping it off, it starts to drip onto a guy made up of entirely pride, vanity, and anger. Edward Brock Jr. I genuinely love everything about Eddie in this movie. I love Topher Grace and how he plays him, and I especially love the way Sam envisions that character. Eddie represents a Peter without morals, a guy who probably didn't have an Uncle Ben and Aunt May in his life. He has no empathy for anyone. Oh my God, that's Gwen. Who are you? It's Brock, sir. Edward Brock Jr. I work at the Daily Bugle and I'm dating your daughter. He'll do anything to get what he wants, and what he wants is exactly what Peter wants. Eddie wants to marry Gwen after going on one date with her. <laughs> we had coffee, Eddie. He has a goddamn picture of Gwen on his desk. He wants the staff job at the Daily Bugle after freelancing there for a little over a week, and in order to get that staff job, he is dumb enough to Photoshop a photo that Peter took. And probably worst of all, he views himself as the hero, as the good guy. Eddie thinks of himself as just a cool guy trying to live a happy life with a girl he thinks is cute. And when he doesn't get that, when he gets what's coming to him, he turns to religion. You want forgiveness? Get religion. And the bastard actually does it. He turns to God to... Ask you for one thing. I want you to kill Peter Parker. Eddie Brock is this hilarious, sleazy, and greasy parody of Peter Parker. The entitled brat with absolutely no sympathy and absolutely no understanding of people. And I love it. It's perfect. Raimi was pushed to do Venom, so he did the Sam Raimi version of Venom. Raimi took a character from the comics that he didn't have that much love nor appreciation for and made him someone that he could tackle. He turned Eddie Brock into the sleaze ball reflection of Peter and used Eddie to showcase what Peter could become if he gave into these emotions he's tempted by throughout the film. So I love Sandman and how he affects Peter, and I love the symbiote and how it affects Peter, and I love Eddie and what he shows us about Peter. But what about the third villain of the movie? What about Harry? What about the goblin? Sorry, sorry, I, I keep fucking forgetting. You knew this was coming, Pete. <laughs> The New Goblin. My least favorite villain of the trilogy. The only villain that doesn't fully work for me and that 
sucks. Franco is clearly having a goddamn blast. Strawberries. And Raimi has been building up to it for two movies. And now that it's finally here, now that Harry has become the bad guy, it feels rushed. The last time we saw Harry in Spider-Man 2, he was dealing with the realization that his best friend is also the guy he's been directing all his anger and rage towards. He saw his father, or his own crazed idea of his father, scream at him telling Harry to AVENGE ME! And you know what Harry said to that? No! He says no. So he finds out that his dad, who he thinks Spider-Man just straight up killed, is actually the Green Goblin. And now, he's going to avenge him? That doesn't work for me no matter which way I look at it. I would understand Harry more if we saw him slowly lose his mind. We saw him constantly be tempted by his father to keep the Goblin legacy alive. But we don't get to see any of that because, frankly, the movie doesn't have time to really develop nor define Harry as a villain. Can't forget the amnesia plot. Bump on the head, I'm as free as a bird. <laughs> I do love the idea that we get to see Harry and Peter be friends again. Raimi even dresses Harry in the outfit he wore in Spider-Man 1, back when these guys were just two best friends looking out for each other. That's how Ivan and I felt, along with Alvin, Sergeant, that we had to experience the friendship so it meant something. It was tangible for the audience. We couldn't just, we couldn't just remember a bit of it from the first picture. Mm -hmm. We had to have it here and now so that Peter's recognition of what was important by the end of the picture had some, some weight to it. and. The sacrifice had some weight to it, some drama. But the amnesia thing feels unnatural and feels like a way to put a pause to Harry's villainy to focus on the other characters for a chunk of the movie. But something changes with Harry in the third act. Everything in the movie changes in the third act. After this wonderful fight set to an upbeat jazz score and Harry's face goes <laughs> forgiveness. When Spider-Man 3 reaches its third act, when all of its villains, its themes and ideas come together, it's magic. The same magnificent magic I feel when watching the first two films. Peter is alone, truly alone now. He has hurt Harry. He has hurt Mary Jane. The trio we have been following for three movies is completely separated. Pete is at his lowest point in the film, probably in the trilogy, and there's only one person who can pull him back up. Hi, Peter. Hi. I love how Peter is so isolated, feels so ashamed, and we see that all conveyed visually. May and his entire apartment remain out of focus, separating Peter from everything, even the woman who raised him. I hurt her, Aunt May. I don't know what to do. You start by doing the hardest thing. You forgive yourself. And that's what the entire third act is about. Forgiveness. We get this incredible set piece at the construction site where Mary Jane is stuck between two monsters that Peter could have stopped. She is literally tangled up in Peter's wrongdoings, his sins. And there is only one way for him to save her. It's not by physically beating Venom or beating Sandman, but by rediscovering his empathy and remembering that that empathy is what makes him Spider-Man. After watching Peter be a full of himself douchebag and then an edgy creep for most of the movie, it's such a relief to see our good-hearted Peter come back to us. Peter dons the red suit and swings to the rescue, but it's not an ego-filled swing that we have witnessed throughout this film. It's a heroic swing. Spider-Man is back. Look! This is one of the few fights in the trilogy where Spider-Man loses completely. He's beat and almost killed by villains of his own making. All hope is lost and we feel that this could really be the end of Spider-Man. But someone comes to the rescue. God damn, that's so fucking good. Everyone is over here freaking about Cap lifting Thor's hammer, but this was that moment for me as a kid. Seeing Harry forgive Peter and seeing two friends work together to save the day. Sure, it's cheesy, but you can't deny how sweet and heartwarming it is to see these two finally come back together to save someone they have both wronged, that they have both cared for and loved for three films. Go, buddy! Ha 
How could you also not love the over the top civilians watching this whole thing go down and reacting just like we are? Just like the end of Spider-Man 2, Peter attempts to reach Eddie, but Eddie has been swallowed up and consumed by the hate and vengeance that has almost consumed Peter. Let it go. I like being bad. It makes me happy. As we see in a few minutes, Eddie would rather die angry, die with the symbiote, than live without it. Peter is about to die again. Jesus Christ, what a day this guy's having. But <laughs> perfect, absolutely perfect. Harry's father killed himself by giving in to his dark side, his goblin side. And Harry dies by giving in to his human side, by doing the right thing. Both impaled by their own gliders, one impaled by selfishness and the other through selflessness. Peter has grown from someone who couldn't admit that he was wrong, that he was doing wrong, to someone who has the ability to look at his dying friend and tell him he's sorry. I should never have hurt you. I've said those things. None of that matters, Peter. You're my friend. Best friend. Someone who can look at the man who killed his uncle, took his father away from him, and say, I've done terrible things too. I forgive you. I'm through with love, I'll never fall again. The end. The ending of Spider-Man 3 is one of the most profoundly beautiful things in a superhero movie. In a crowded film with alien symbiotes bonding with Topher Grace, Sandman, and the Winter Soldier. In a trilogy with breathtaking genre-defining action and spectacle. In a series that pushed the limits of filmmaking at the time, we end in a small jazz bar where our hero and his love share a moment of tenderness and forgiveness. No final swing, no dialogue, just a slow sweet dance with the kid who got bit by a spider and the girl next door. The final 25 second shot has the couple embrace as we end the film. The trilogy on Peter Parker going from a feeling of guilt and sadness to a feeling of relief, comfort, and contentment. Nobody is perfect. Everybody struggles. Everyone falls, everyone gives in to their demons, even Spider-Man. I think the final lines ever spoken by Sam Raimi's Peter Parker sum it up perfectly. Whatever comes our way, whatever battle we have raging inside us, we always have a choice. My friend Harry taught me that. He chose to be the best of himself. It's the choices that make us who we are. And we can always choose to do what's right. Forgiveness, rediscovering empathy, and making sure to keep that empathy in the face of success is such a great theme and note for Sam to end the story of Peter Parker on. The idea is kind of meta in a way. Despite all its flaws, all the studio interference and pressure on Raimi due to the overwhelming success of Spider-Man 1 and 2, Spider-Man 3 manages to keep its focus on empathy. Like I said at the start of the video, this movie isn't flawless, but I would never consider it bad. Its huge $350 million heart is so in the right place and the story it chooses to tell is risky, mature, and entirely honest. It's completely cheesy, but 100% sincere. I long for the days where we got cape flicks that take the time to show two friends goofily dancing while cooking an omelet, or our hero watching the love of his life fulfill her dreams. I long for the days where the human moments took center stage. You have to think that Raimi knew, deep down, that this would be his last entry. The story ends too perfectly. Of course, we all know he had plans for Spider-Man 4. We know that he still thinks about Spider-Man 4. I think about it all the time. It's hard not to, because each summer another Spider-Man film comes out, so when you have an unborn one, you can't help but think what might have been.
We may never have gotten Spider-Man 4. We probably will never get Spider-Man 4 if we're being honest. Spider-Man 3 will most likely always serve as the almost perfect finale. But that doesn't mean the trilogy, Sam Raimi's trilogy, will be forgotten. It's been 17 years since the release of Spider-Man. 12 years since Spider-Man 3. And I still see it talked about everywhere. Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. There is an entire subreddit with over 200,000 users dedicated to memeing and loving this trilogy. I wanted to make this series to share my love and hopefully help you rediscover that love, or at least understand my undying obsession with this series. Growing up poor and feeling very misunderstood, feeling alone, I can't tell you the life-changing effect seeing the story of a poor and lonely superhero had on me. It gave me someone to look up to, to aspire to be. I still think about it every single day, and will continue to think about, rewatch, and endlessly adore the Raimi Spider-Man trilogy until the day that I die. And you know what? I don't think I'm alone in that. Not by a long shot. All these people are cheering on Spider-Man and, uh, and the coming of the movie. And what it really means is um, they recognize that a story recognizes the goodness within, potential within all of us. That's what these Spider-Man stories are. Peter Parker is a kid who's coming of age and recognizing he's capable of greatness and good deeds and the beauty of responsibility and the, and the beauty of love. And that's what these people know to be true, that love is beautiful, that they're all capable of being heroic. And the movies just tell these familiar stories with a very familiar character, Spider-Man. And I've come to realize that's what the, all the hoopla is really about, is people celebrating the recognition of storytellers, actors, writers, telling that story that they know to be true and that they love about themselves. I just had a great time making these movies with all the people that uh, that's worked on them. And I really feel like it's given me so much and we've got a little family unit working together to make these films and I feel like they were our films for many years and and now they're yours so thank you pizza time pizza time yeah! you're late I'm not paying for those you got any more nuts um uh, I I have some nuts I can make some go make me some Back to formula. <laughs> Hello, my dear. I think my favorite line from the trilogy would have to be after Spider-Man defeats the Green Goblin at the World Unity Festival, and he yells, "Kill me the yes, Spider-Man!" This whole trilogy just meant the world to me as a kid. From one of my earliest Christmases, my I remember my first DVD I ever owned was Spider-Man, and I even quoted the Green Goblin in my SAT essay. All of these films I just always thought were just masterpieces, and I I, I love them to this day. A thief! A criminal! He stole my suit! He's a menace to the entire city! Thanks for the good news. Pizza <laughs> time. See ya, chump. If anyone lost a big roll of $20 bills wrapped in a rubber band, and uh, good news. He found the rubber band. And it really shaped me as a person. These new movies, however, they're... They're what I like to call... Brilliant but lazy. <laughs> Wait one sec. There we go. You'll get your rent when you fix this damn door! Amy Trilogy is everything to me. It's what is inspiring me to become an animator because of those beautiful swinging sequences. I love the third movie the most because it's the most entertaining and we get to explore the dark side of Peter Parker. And my favorite quote from the Raimi Trilogy, You'll get your rent when you fix this damn door! Oh, you stole those guys, that guy's pizzas! And it was like this amazing moment for me in the theater and I started like, um, I just started smiling. It's crazy how much uh, Sam Raimi's films, specifically the Spider-Man films, affected me since I was little and how much it affected me as a filmmaker going forward. You know, I guess one person can make a difference. Enough said. Enough said. Spider-Man with his hand in a cookie jar. <laughs> and then what the trilogy means to me, shit. Whatever life holds in store for me, I will never forget these words. With great power comes great responsibility. This is my gift. This is my curse. Who am I? Who am I? I'm Spider-Man. I am a Spider-Man. Cool Spidey outfit. Thanks. I believe that there is a hero in all of us.
that keeps us honest, gives us strength, and makes us noble. It finally allows us to die with pride, even though sometimes we have to be steady and give up the thing we want the most. Because as the audience, we make small and make sacrifices every day. And seeing how much Peter Parker sacrifices his love, his work, his um, education to be Spider-Man, it makes us gravitate towards him and his story and have an even bigger love for him as a character. The great thing about MJ is when you look in her eyes and she looks back into yours, everything feels not quite normal. I just always really identify with Peter because he's just like a normal dude who had some problems, kind of shy, awkward. Um, who was just trying to do the right thing and sometimes that was hard and sometimes it didn't work out for him But he he kept pushing through and he always persevered and he always came out on top and always gave his all There's just something about Peter's character that you could just relate to and that was the whole point of Spider-Man's creation To mirror the people who read him who watched him, you know, I look up to heroes like Cap, but like I, When I watch Spider-Man, I feel like I am him it was also one of the first films that really got me into films. The Raimi trilogy started my love of movies and started my love of Marvel and comics and just all that stuff. After the final battle, uh, Sandman tells Peter his side of the story of what happened to Uncle Ben for then Peter to say, I forgive you. And I think that really represents the character of Peter a lot and shows what all heroes should aspire to be. Sam Raimi trilogy actually taught me how to write and create such a wonderful heart, heartfelt story. So yeah, I don't know I will, if I will be able to do it in my future careers or not, but you know, I think of making him proud one day. Seriously, it's, it's wonderful and really great. Growing up in a lower income household and seeing Spider-Man the superhero at the time struggling with like bills and having like low income and just being a real person and having to work jobs he didn't like kind of made me and my brother see a potential of like oh if we struggle with this and even our superheroes do that's okay and it helped us get through really hard times while also appreciating the small things. When I was a little kid, my family was growing more and more distant every day that went by, and I felt like I'd never be okay. But seeing Peter Parker go through very similar things, and him finding the strength to get up again, him finding the strength to be okay, made me feel like I could do the exact same thing. Despite his flaws, he can still be a hero. Sam Raimi did a good job showing how human Peter Parker really is when he's not being Spider-Man. And that's what I liked about it, because unlike most superheroes, you can see how human he is. He wants love, he wants to graduate from college, he wants to pay his rent. He's just human, just like us. Since I was three years old, when that first movie came out, you know, I just, I watched it over and over, and I loved it. And I, you know, there was nothing more in my life that I wanted to be than, than Spider-Man, and, you know, I can, attribute a lot to the kind of person that I am today because of those movies and you know just I'm always at a loss for words when, when I get a chance to watch them and the kind of impact that it leaves on me so thank you. Now being 21 and living in Philadelphia on my own as a photographer these movies hit me at a completely different level and I think in 10 years or so they'll hit me on another level. Thank you, Sam Raimi. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy is super important to me. It gave me the career option of becoming a comic book penciler because it inspired my love for comic books and Spider-Man. And more importantly, it taught me how to cope with my own father's death and taught me that I can make good out of it. Yeah, I was born on the first film's release date. It's been in my life since then. Not only is it part of the reason why I want to make films, but it also taught me what it really means to be the hero. When I was a little kid, um, Spider-Man was one of the first movies that I saw, and uh, he's what got me into the whole superhero genre, and I feel like without Spider-Man and the same Raimi films, I wouldn't have been interested in that, and I wouldn't be where I am today without Spider-Man. The films at their core aren't superhero stories, they're human stories, and I think that's why people have latched on really tight, regardless of if Spider-Man is the main character. Raimi trilogy means so much to me. 
and it was the first thing that really got me into comic books and superheroes and will always have a special place in my heart. Raimi's Spider-Man has really shaped the person that I am today by living up to my responsibilities. Realizing that many blessings can also be a curse, but it's my responsibility to use those blessings every single day to the best of my ability. To me, what is amazing about the Raimi Spider-Man trilogy is the heart that is put into the movie and the characters and how much you can relate to Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man and want to be like him. For someone who comes from a very poor country, I grew up in Congo, precisely in Kinshasa, we had electricity issues, water issues, I grew up in an environment I didn't necessarily like, but I, but I was able to make it out and live my best life today. And I think I probably owe some of it to the Spider-Man trilogy. I grew up a really poor kid, and the first Christmas that I remember, I got a VHS copy of Spider-Man. And I remember watching it so much that I ended up burning the tape in the player. I've carried this movie throughout my entire life because it means so much to me that Sam Raimi made a hero that I could relate to and that I could look up to and it could be my hero.